All right, uh, let's get started with our unit two review. Um, that is the Reformation. So I'm gonna pull that up. Here we go. All right, so that is again the Reformation. Um, all these subunits will begin. The point one will be contextualization, kind of setting up what's going on in this unit, important things from last unit or in the past, and then the last. Uh, slide of each unit will be some kind of historical thinking skill, be that causation or comparison or something else. So anyway, um, 2.1, contextualization. So in unit one, we recapped quickly um, things like Erasmus humanists who are complaining about the church, who are looking for ways to uh, increase the education level of the clergy, to reduce the corruption, to reduce um, you know, the strictness of it, the rules and the hierarchy, rather than the maybe the important things, according to these guys, uh, the, the faith and everything else. So some quick examples of how religious division had already begun. It's not like Martin Luther is the first of the reformers. Way back when we talked about Jan Hus and the Hussite church, and uh, they successfully break away from the Roman Catholic church. Again, Erasmus and other humanists have started to complain about the corruption of the church. And Luther is going to be uh, the one who kind of sets the whole thing off, but he's certainly not the first guy to have complaints with the church. So there's a quote out there, and I think I mentioned it last week, or last uh, video, was Erasmus laid the egg that Luther hatched, right? That all these complaints that Luther has, uh, some of them are original complaints of his, probably, but a lot of them are piggybacking on previous thinkers' ideas and previous reformers' ideas. When we talk about the Reformation, it is appealing to average people, uh, maybe more so than Catholicism in some ways because it's a little more in tune <clears throat> with the average life and the average mindset. And people see that this, these new Reformed churches are maybe a little more uh, people-centered than hierarchy and, tra and tradition-centered like the Catholic Church is, and especially was uh, if we're talking early 1500s. When cities are getting bigger, uh, after we talked about unit one, the growth of cities comes with the rise of commercialism and better agricultural practices, people moving to cities, ideas naturally are going to spread faster. So, you know, like most things in history, all these things are kind of intertwined, uh, working together, not independently. 2.2, Luther. Um, Martin Luther is a German monk. Remember, he criticizes indulgences uh, and people like Johann Tetzel who are selling them and indulgences were those ways you could donate money to the church and then some sin would be forgiven or a family member would be released from purgatory, something like that, right? And Luther sees that as a moral negative that people essentially could buy their way into heaven or at least pay their way out of sins or hell or purgatory or whatever that is. So a quick little quote that kind of defines Lutheranism or Luther's specific brand of Reformed Christianity, faith alone, grace alone, scripture alone, right? These are the three things that are going to get you into heaven, not actions, not anything else, having faith, uh, behaving like a Christian and following scripture to the letter. And most importantly, not listening to the Pope and not falling into the hierarchy and thinking that these traditions have to be followed to the letter if you're going to be considered a Christian or a follower in the eyes of God. Uh, John Calvin and Calvinism, another denomination. Calvin believes in predestination or the total power of God. Thus, humans are powerless. And if God is all powerful, then all of our actions are dictated by God and not our personal choices. And that only some people are saved, right? So it's a very uh, closed off version of Christianity where Christianity is not meant for everybody, right? But again, there is no single power over the top. There isn't a Calvinist Pope or a Calvinist leader that dictates uh, things to their followers. And, you know, this is just, these are just two of several denominations that are going to form uh, post Luther, right? And just the more denominations that form, the more education there is, the more people are thinking independently and individually, then obviously the more opinions or conceptions there will be on Christianity. Some specific topics that um, could pop up that I see as kind of and the important ones, and there's certainly more than this. This is a good starting point. The German Peasants' War, which is post uh, Luther's Reformation when the peasants are unhappy about high food prices and high rent and all the usual things peasants are angry about. 
and the peasants being inspired by Luther standing up to the Catholic Church, they decide they're going to stand up to their local secular rulers or the princes of the Holy Roman Empire, and they assume that Luther is going to back them or support them, but he doesn't. And his reasoning is Luther is only concerned with the Reformation because he believes he is saving souls or preventing souls from damnation, which he believes by following the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church is leading them that way. But he is not concerned with secular desires and needs and worldly desires and needs, right? Or earthly, I guess I should say. And so, yes, peasants may be starving and maybe uh, are being treated unfairly, but those things aren't going to matter when it comes to admission into heaven, right? So Luther does not want to um, threaten secular leaders. He is only worried about religion. The Anabaptists are a, another religious group that are going to take the Reformation uh, a little more radically, right? Radical reformers. And so they are going to only listen to what the Bible says, and they will respect no secular leaders as having any real control or influence over them. And they will only listen to the Bible, right? So they will uh, remove themselves from taxation that is not biblical or the tithe and things like that, right? So radical reformers are ones who are going to completely reject any sort of hierarchy at all and only listen to the Bible, right? That scripture is the one true source of knowledge in Christianity and nothing else is. 2.3, Protestant reform continues. Um, of course, we talked about printing last video and understanding the connection with all these early topics, be it Reformation, Enlightenment, whatever, that without the printing press, these things don't happen or they happen much, much, much slower. So with Bibles being printed in the vernacular, Luther is going to translate a Bible into German or vernacular German. Other languages will, will start to see versions of the Bible being printed in it. And of course, if people are literate in the vernacular, they can read the Bible. And then there's all sorts of ideas that can open up and interpretations that can happen if you have who knows how many people reading the Bible and coming to their own conclusions. Um, like we just talked about with even Calvinists and Anabaptists about it's not like the battle between church and state is going to be any less uh, prevalent with Protestants than it is Catholics. Protestants are going to still have the issue with who takes supremacy here, right? Whose laws uh, do I follow first? And so if you're John Calvin, and Calvinist, and you believe that all humans have already had their destiny pre-ordained uh, to them, and they're just following kind of like a railroad track or something, then what the secular leaders re do really doesn't matter. And it's uh, pointless to follow a secular leader if you believe in predestination, right? Because anything they tell me um, doesn't really matter. Same thing, like we talked about with Anabaptists, any secular laws or secular authority will be ignored by Anabaptists because they don't believe that uh, it has anything to do with getting to heaven. So why would I concern myself with it? So in your, or in the uh, unit guide that College Board puts out, there's really hardly any mentions of King Henry VIII in there, which makes me think, odds are you won't get a King Henry VIII question on your DBQ, but... Um, he is, of course, considered a reformer, though he reforms for a lot different reasons than someone like Calvin or Luther did. He reforms, yes, because he wants a divorce um, from his wife, Catherine of Aragon. There's also the political reasons of I can assume all the power that the, and land and, and funds and everything else that the Catholic Church has in England. And now those are my powers and funds and land. And um, so he's another obvious example of a reformer, but in a different way. Wars of religion. So knowing about Charles V, um, knowing about the French wars of religion, like the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, where religion becomes a political division as well. How a lot of uh, nobles in France were Calvinists or Huguenots, while the monarchy of France and the king of France was Catholic. And you start seeing divisions along that line as well. Um, you'll see eventually post St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre and Edict of Nantes, which allows Huguenots the freedom to worship and certain civil rights in France. And it's an example of a government or a secular state or a secular authority making decisions above the church, right? The Catholic Church would never say that in France, now if you are not a Catholic, you are free to worship how you believe. The state has to do that. And the state, being tired of war and tired of this religious division, that's never going to end anytime soon, they will legislate that, right? And then eventually, 
with absolutism and Louis XIV, he will revoke the Edict of Nantes and declare a uh, universal religion in a very absolutist way. So um, as far as things like the Thirty Years' War, which is what the Peace of Westphalia ends, the Thirty Years' War is a good example of how these wars start off as kind of local religious conflicts like in the Holy Roman Empire or modern day Germany. And then they get larger and larger and larger. And yeah, it's still Catholic versus Protestant, but now we have these big giant countries in the war and they're just in it for good old fashioned reasons, right? To gain more land, to gain more power, to get more money. Um, so a term to really know, Peace of Westphalia, it ends the Thirty Years' War, and it's a turning point in European history, and it marks the end of time period one, 1648, uh, because it ends large-scale religious or war in Europe, right? There will be religious skirmishes and pogroms and things going forward, of course, but never will there be a Catholic versus Protestant uh, international war again. And so this is a turning point because going forward, countries and governments, they still will push certain religions, certainly, and prioritize certain religions. But pluralism or a, a group of different religions having uh, several followers in a country or a state or a city, they are, it's going to be the norm, right? That most countries are going to have some sort of religious division within them, and that becomes kind of an unavoidable thing for the vast majority of the countries, right? And that idea of universal Christendom, that all Europeans or all citizens of the, of the earth should all follow the same brand of Christianity, uh, that is an idea of the past now, right? That is never going to happen. Uh, the HRE, the Holy Roman Empire, will slowly start to dissolve and crumble as they no longer have one religion tying them all together, you know, the uh, Roman Catholic Church. Now you have different princes choosing to adopt different Protestant religions, then the HRE as a unified thing starts to, again, slowly kind of dissolve. Keep in mind where the Reformation is most impactful, and that'll be France and the Holy Roman Empire or modern day Germany and places where the Reformation really doesn't matter. Uh, places like Spain and Italy and a lot of Ireland where, you know, they will stay Catholic and they're overwhelmingly Catholic even today. Um, so St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, and that kind of ties in with Henry IV. Uh, it's the massacre of all those important Huguenots or Calvinists in France as nobles. Um, eventually, Henry IV or good King Henry, a Protestant or a, a Huguenot, converts to Catholicism so he can become king. And so, you know, there's that kind of real politic idea there where Henry IV is going to abandon his personal religious beliefs and adopt uh, Catholicism or convert to Catholicism because he knows it's better for the country. And of course, he gets to be king of France now. And so when he says Paris is well worth a mass, that's what he's talking about, right? I would rather go to mass and be a Catholic, even if I don't truly believe it, um, if it means I get to be king of a country. Charles V and the Habsburgs, you know, I didn't do a very good job of probably going over those as well as I should have back in the fall. Um, and I, probably won't cover them very much on these videos here, but knowing a little bit about the Habsburgs, having some information about those could be very beneficial if you get a DBQ from this time period, 1500s, 1600s. Uh, the Catholic Reformation or the Counter Reformation and how the Catholics respond to all this is obviously they see the church is falling apart and they have to adapt and that will be done through the Council of Trent, which is a series of meetings um, with representatives from different states, and of course the Catholic Church there to try to figure out how can we reconcile um, with these reformers or these people who have left, can we bring them back, you know, what can we do to kind of stop the bleeding here. And so certainly, um, like it says in those bottom couple bullets, the Catholic Church is not going to really change any dogma or any doctrine. They are not going to reduce the power of the Pope or say that the Catholic Church can be incorrect or uh, wrong with their interpretation of the Bible or religion. And so those things do not change, but the Catholic Church does make it a concerted effort to improve the education of their clergy, to figure out better ways of appealing to average people who might have felt a little swamped or overwhelmed by the power and the hierarchy of the Catholic Church. So some groups maybe to know the Jesuits and the Ursulines or the nuns, you know, the nuns there to uh, educate women on how to be better Catholics. The Jesuits there as essentially missionaries to spread um, 
the prestige of Catholicism and including when we when you think about the New World and Spain conquering North America and South America and Central America and those countries being overwhelmingly Catholic today, the Jesuits have a big part of that. Um, again, the Catholic Church is still going to be the one disseminator of religious knowledge and dogma. So that index prohibited books is an example of the Catholic Church saying this is what you cannot and should not and will not read because these ideas go counter to the Catholic Church. So the works of those humanists and those reformers, uh, those are books you are not supposed to read if you're a Catholic, right? Don't even expose yourself to those ideas because the Catholic Church is saying they are so wrong, um, you know, you're risking certain things by even attempting to read them. So that bottom bullet, you know, this cements or this solidifies that the Protestants and the Catholics are different, right? They're not coming back together. The Catholic Church would have to give up too much and it'd probably be even impossible at this point for the Catholic Church to convince these millions of people who have left um, to come back. 2.6, 16th century society and politics. So throughout most of this class, right, um, and I, I would talk about this every once in a while in lecture, it's important to remember that women, until really we get to the 20th century, are going to see their roles and their rights and everything else in life and society are going to grow very, very slowly for a long, long time, right? But the Renaissance and the Reformation starts this debate, and it kind of gets the wheels turning a little bit after centuries and centuries of a very static um, society as far as men and women, okay? And so obviously, if you think about these things, right? In the Renaissance, you have new ideas. You have um, the rebirth of these old ideas. And so you can't have all these new perceptions on life and society and humanity and then look at half of the population and not think about their role and not think maybe it's grown a little bit or it's changing. Same thing with the Reformation. You can't on one hand, you can't on one hand, um, contradict and battle a thousand year old uh, institution like the Catholic Church and then not think about changing other things in society, right? If you have the ability and the guts and the bravery to attack this institution, then what other institutions or what other longstanding ideas are people now thinking about changing or at least discussing that there might be some flaws to them? Uh, as the church starts to be separated and disintegrate a little bit, secular laws or state laws now also have the added responsibility of regulating morals, that the church is no longer the end all be all with regulating morals. And so if you do have religious pluralism in your state or your city, and you've got people of different denominations, and they might have different interpretations on what is correct as far as morals go, uh, now you have to go past the church or church is, and say these are what the city says, or what the country says, or the state says about what you should do as a moral human being or moral citizen of our country or our city. Um, on witchcraft, when, in these smaller countries or these smaller states, especially like the Holy Roman Empire, Switzerland uh, was one we talked about way back when, I believe, where, again, there is no strong central religious authority anymore. There starts to be those kind of power vacuums, even in very small scales, and you will see those witchcraft accusations um, because everyone is, you know, at this point in time, the 1500s, a lot of people are afraid of being influenced by the devil and by Satan and all these other things um, because of the constant rhetoric you're hearing about, you know, heaven and hell and everything else, right? But again, these are really just in smaller areas. Big cities don't have witchcraft uh, or witchcraft trials and things like that, like the smaller uh, states of Holy Roman Empire will. Public humiliation for deviating from norms. Again, these are ways that citizens are still going to control the morality and actions of their people uh, even if there is not a central religious authority over them, right? So if you do something um, that goes against your cultural norms in your town, there are no maybe laws to, pu to uh, punish you, but the other citizens of that town will publicly humiliate you, not only to punish you, but to prevent other people um, from acting out the way you did, right? If you see someone else get tarred and feathered and march through town being yelled at and ridiculed, you might not do that same action, right? Because you don't want to go through that. Um, things that do stay the same is you still have very wealthy landowners. You still have the same kind of class hierarchy. 
like it says here, aristocratic privileges, um, you know, those things aren't changing, right? Religion is changing, but society, as far as the hierarchy, is a slow, slow, slow change. Uh, we missed out on my kind of art crash course that I planned on doing. Maybe I'll do it eventually, um, since I think we'll have plenty of time. But a little bit about Baroque art, which is the Catholic Church's response to the art of the Renaissance and the art of uh, Protestant churches, where art becomes a way that both churches, Catholic churches and Protestant churches, can increase their prestige and increase just the attractive attractiveness of the church with these uh, sculptures and paintings and everything else. And so a lot of Protestant art had become, a better, and, like, and really how Protestantism is, kind of appealing to the person um, as an individual rather than just a cog in the you know, hierarchy of the Catholic Church. So you know, the Catholic Church is going to replicate this kind of simple individualist art and again, it's just a way to appeal to the average person, person to show that the Catholic Church is not this um, impenetrable institution that nobody can understand or appreciate, but you have to listen to them anyway. All right, last one, 2.8, causation in the age of Reformation, the wars of religion, kind of what things uh, are happening and what's the result of these ref uh, Reformation events and what do they mean going forward? So, of course, like we talked about, uh, the division of Catholics and Protestants is cemented, it's solidified, it's not going to do anything but widen going forward. Something we didn't really talk about in class is the Protestant work ethic and kind of what that means. And so a shift and something that's a little more common in the Reformed churches is this idea of work and money and how if you're a Calvinist, for instance, and you believe in kind of an all-powerful entity and the in inherent weakness of you, and you find yourself having success in business and you're making money and you're becoming somewhat wealthy or whatever, uh, you might interpret that as you're doing the right thing, right? And now this kind of success is becoming intertwined with what you deem as God's uh, favor. And again, that's that idea of a Protestant work ethic, right? That I'm gonna work hard, I'm gonna kind of put my nose to the grindstone, and when good things start happening to me, that's a sign that God is saying, good job, keep going. Um, we talked about when factions of Christianity are fighting, state governments are going to use this opportunity to increase their power to start controlling more aspects of day-to-day -day life, right? The state is becoming, um, or I should say the church is becoming subservient uh, to the state. We talked about cities will get larger, and that's only going to continue to grow, and the Industrial Revolution hasn't even happened yet, and that's when urbanization will really uh, take off. And then, of course, like we were talking about with women, uh, or the question of women's role in society, you can't just question one giant institution like the church and not naturally start questioning other longstanding uh, institutions or challenging ideas and theories that have been around for a long, long time. And so eventually down the line in a unit or two, when we start talking about enlightenment and, you know, for example, the heliocentric theory versus the geocentric theory or, um, you know, what's in space and what are stars made of and what's everything else, you know, all these ancient ideas that have been around for hundreds and hundreds of years, just like the Catholic church has, people start finding out new information and that kind of skeptical idea of, I'm going to challenge this information, right? All this knowledge is at my fingertips. Um, and just because something's been around for hundreds of years, just because someone's old, just because someone's said these things for so long, that doesn't inherently make them correct. Um, so, you know, we kind of go on these stages, right? The Renaissance and all these new ideas lead to people challenging the church. People challenging the church lead to people challenging more uh, longstanding ideas and institutions. Okay, so that is unit two. I will get to work on unit three soon and we'll uh, start making our way through more and more AP Euro content. All right, uh, thanks for watching. If you made it through all 25 or so minutes of this video, uh, you should pat yourself on the back. That's pretty impressive work. Keep studying, keep watching Tom Ritchie videos, Paul Sargent videos, read your textbook, whatever you gotta do, uh, but you learn your content. All right, guys, see you soon.